Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Srivatsa. I work in the Linux kernel group uh, at Qualcomm Bangalore. Uh, we have been working, uh, uh, we're playing with Word.io on a type 1 hypervisor. We saw several problems uh, that we had to solve. So this is an attempt to summarize uh, some of those problems and some of the solutions that uh, we think will work. Uh, so this is the first step towards um, uh, making the community aware of the problems we are seeing. And following this, we will publish some of the code we have and seek uh, comments. So uh, first of all, I just want to quickly say, uh, you know, what's driving virtualization in some of the embedded uh, products uh, that uh, Qualcomm um, deals with. Uh, you know, it's things like mobile phones, uh, automotive uh, in, in infotainment products. Uh, the, 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 one of the biggest reason is perhaps uh, consolidation uh, to save cost. So earlier, what uh, we would see is, you know, uh, uh, applications running in silos on separate hardware units. Uh, with uh, modern uh, SOCs becoming very powerful and more importantly, supporting some of the required virtualization features, uh, it becomes uh, easy to kind of consolidate all these applications on one hardware unit uh, and reduce cost. Uh, while we are consolidating, the, you know, we also want strong isolation. Uh, between these applications, uh, you know, so that if one of those uh, uh, operating systems crashes, the mission critical ones are not affected, right? So that's one uh, reason. The other uh, reason is uh, some of the uh, security uh, sensitive applications uh, uh, by moving it to run in the context of a different uh, operating system, we gain better isolation so that uh, if, for example, if the Android OS is uh, compromised, uh, uh, it does not uh, um, result in data leaks or uh, in, in the security uh, sensitive application being compromised as well. So that's, uh, that's the reason why virtualization is gaining traction in some of the products uh, Qualcomm makes. Uh, and while doing this, uh, we had to run, uh, we ran into how we can provide the abstraction of, um, uh, you know, uh, various devices like uh, uh, CPU, memory, and IO. Um, so each um, uh, uh, operating system or application expects its own set of resources. So how do we provide that illusion was the question we were trying to answer. So this talk is more focused on IO device uh, virtualization. So by IO devices, uh, what I mean is uh, beyond uh, you know, the typical uh, uh, IO devices like storage network console. Uh, in case of embedded products, we also are considering uh, things like uh, your sound card, display, uh, GPU, camera, and touch screen. So for example, it might be possible to carve up the display so that one operating system gets a part of the display um, uh, to display some uh, whatever it wants and, and other part of the display is available to the other operating system, right? So, and the same thing for things like sound card, right? Uh, so it's possible like, you know, in case of auto automotive infotainment unit, uh, while Android is having control of the sound, sound card for most of the time, if the mission critical RTOS wants to uh, just alert that, you know, some sensory information, it should be able to immediately, uh, you know, use the sound card and, 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 and you know, um, uh, uh, output whatever it wants to, right? So, so how do we achieve uh, IO virtualization? Um, um, uh, there are two approaches. Um, uh, one is the full virtualization. Um, where um, the guest OS uh, runs some unmodified uh, IO driver and all the uh, emulation of the device happens in the hypervisor. Uh, uh, and, and this could be potentially slow uh, compared to para virtualization where the guest is aware that it's running in a virtual environment um, and uh, it, it uh, works cooperatively. It cooperates with uh, the hypervisor uh, for this uh, IO illusion to uh, to be achieved, right? And it's it's potentially way faster in terms of performance. Um, so the uh, the framework for para virtualization predominantly used in Linux and other operating system as well is Vertio. So we want we started looking at Vertio, what it takes to run. Uh, in the environment uh, we had, right? So, so this is a first brief introduction to what Vertio is. Uh, I'm sure most of you would be aware, but I just want to summarize. 
So these are the key components uh, of the Vertio. So what, is, what I've shown in the green box is a guest operating system. Uh, uh, it has uh, two layers. One is the Vertio front-end driver. So this could be your storage driver, network driver, console driver. Uh, so the, the various uh, drivers that knows how to drive a virtual uh, device of a particular type. And below that is a, a transport layer, which knows how to communicate, uh, how, how to bridge the front end and the back end drivers. Uh, so uh, 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 so the, the back end driver runs in the context outside the guest operating system. Uh, uh, it could be in the hypervisor or in a, another uh, operating system. Uh, and what I have shown uh, are these various IO buffers that need to be exchanged uh, uh, between the two sides, uh, between the front end uh, and the back end, right? Uh, and there is a ring protocol that uh, that kind of specifies where the different IO buffers are. Uh, the key thing uh, that I want to point out here is these IO buffers could be of varying sizes. Uh, you know, um, it could be less than, it could be few bytes or multiple pages, right? Uh, and uh, typically they are spread all uh, all over uh, the guest memory. So you cannot, uh, the, uh, we cannot um, enforce that these IO buffers come from a particular section of memory. It could be spread all over the guest memory. Um, and the backend typically needs to access these IO buffers uh, 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 to, uh, so, uh, this kind of uh, summarizes the problems that uh, we had uh, when uh, implementing Vertio uh, on a type one hypervisor. So what I have shown uh, on the left is the typical environment where Vertio is used today, uh, which is let's say KVM, a type two hypervisor. Uh, and this small box is the guest OS. Um, and, and the bigger one is the, you know, some VMM like QMO or LKVM. And, and uh, typically most of the backend uh, drivers are part of this VMM, right? In some cases, it could be part of the host uh, hypervisor itself. But, but the key point is uh, the backend uh, to a large extent uh, has access to the entire uh, guest OS memory. Uh, so accessing all these uh, buffers uh, is not a problem at all for the backend driver. Uh, so the, the, the front end has to just uh, has to just place uh, pointers to these buffers in the ring and ask the backend to uh, perform the IO, right? And it, it, the backend is seamlessly able to access all the buffers. So that is not a luxury uh, we had uh, in the kind of environment we were running in. So, so the, what I've shown here is a type one hypervisor. Uh, it could be something like Zen, for example. Um, uh, so the, the where we wanted to uh, place the backend is in another OS. So for example, uh, this is the secondary OS uh, having the front end portion of, uh, let's say the block driver. The backend portion of the block driver will have to come from another operating system. And in general, uh, the, the type one hypervisor that we are dealing with uh, attempts to block access uh, uh, across uh, uh, OS uh, memory access. So the primary OM, uh, uh, the OS will not be able to access any part of the memory of the secondary OS, right? And that's required from a security and isolation perspective, right? Uh, so that was one of the big problems that we encountered. So how do we, uh, uh, deal with that problem so that the backend is still able to access all the IO buffers uh, that it needs to access, right? So that, that was problem number one. The problem number two that we had to deal with was um, uh, there's something called the MMIO transport. Uh, so remember this transport. So there are various transport that, that are implemented in Linux. One of them is MMIO, uh, memory mapped IO. So typically what that does is uh, yeah, the, it uh, provides a region of uh, memory, uh, which is a config space. Uh, and the front end driver, when it tries to access the config space, uh, it is trapped and, uh, the, and, and, it is handled, uh, and it is handled in the backend driver. So uh, the hypervisor that we were dealing with, um, oh, sorry, what's the requesting?
So the hypervisor we were dealing with uh, did not offer that support. So MMIO transport, what are your MMIO transport was not uh, easily, uh, you know, uh, acceptable uh, for our uh, environment. So the pro that's problem number two. The problem number three that we had was there was no ready to use backend that was out there that would we could immediately um, use uh, in this environment. So typically all these backends are part of a bigger project like KMO or LKVM or CrossVM. Uh, taking out uh, the backend and deploying it in this environment was not a, a straightforward uh, task. So we had to make considerable modifications to make it understand that it's not running in QMO or LKVM and all that. So that's problem number three. So these are the three big problems that we faced. Um, uh, and, and we kind of have a handle on the first two, I think. The third one will probably need uh, some considerable community effort so that the you know the backends uh, that are part of these various projects, KMO, LKVM, and all that can perhaps be consolidated, um, and so that it makes it easy for um, you know for it to be used in any uh, hypervisor environment. So the, the, these are some considerations of the hypervisor um, that uh, we were dealing with. I kind of summarized uh, some of them. The, the key thing is there's no support for MMIO transport. Uh, for communication between VMs, uh, there is a provision for uh, some message passing uh, API uh, and a doorbell uh, mechanism so that you, know, you can send interrupts between, between the two VMs. Uh, and uh, the primary OS um, is like DOM0. Uh, it has uh, access to most of the IO hardware uh, uh, and has all the IO drivers, uh, required IO drivers. Uh, and in most cases, secondary OS do not have access to any IO hardware directly. So they'll have to go through the IO drivers in the primary OS via something like port IO. Uh, so this, sorry, what's the name? Um, I'm not aware of the GPU, uh, this thing, but the ring structure uh, in Vert.io um that i'm shown here uh is 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 very basic it has um, uh, it's it's more than one ring it's the available ring and the used ring uh it it uh, the 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 producer kind of uh, adds buffers in the producer ring and the used ring kind of indicates uh, you know when those io transactions are complete so if that's a question so um Right. So, um, so and I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of blowing up the memory access problem. That's one of the key problems that we had to solve. Um, so this is the one, the primary VM, and this is the secondary VM. Um, well, you know, the the private, the, the white portion is the what is private to each VM, right? Uh, and uh, um, and so there is some provision uh, that our hypervisor provides so that a small fraction of the secondary VM can be shared with the primary VM. Now, you know, so there, there, there is mechanism where some amount of memory can be shared between the two VMs, right? Now, we don't want to extend that facility to share the complete address space because that beats the uh, uh, one of the important goals so that if the secondary VM is running some uh, uh, you know, security sensitive application, uh, its memory should not be made available to the primary VM, right? So we want a large portion of the secondary VM memory to be private to itself. Now we, we are okay to have some another small region of memory shared between the two VMs. So this is the solution we came up with um, to overcome the memory access uh, uh, problem, uh, the, the, the first problem that we had. 
So what we did was um, we made use of the small amount of memory that's shared between the two VMs uh, to bounce buffers. So what that means is uh, when, uh, when there is a IO buffer, uh, let's say B1, that needs to be consumed on the other side, uh, we made some changes to the what IO stack on the secondary VM side, the on the front end side, so that it is copied, right? We bounce it to the shared region. And because the shared region is accessible to the other side, it makes it easy for the, for the back end to consume it, right? So although it's not very good from a performance perspective, but it, this was kind of easy for us to get what are you going uh, in the environment that uh, we are running, right? Uh, so that, the, and and we you know the, there was minimal changes needed uh, to achieve these bonds uh, mostly through uh, DMA ops uh, we had to write some DMA uh, you know uh, yeah, ops unique to this uh, device which will do that bonds and we made use of the SWIO TLB driver which um, uh, which has a lot of the core required code to bonds buffers right so that was the solution we have. Um, so we will shortly publish uh, the changes we made to the Vertio stack to achieve these bounds, right? Uh, so this, yeah, and, and, and the other thing we did was uh, generally these ring, uh, block ring uh, and the console ring, um, the, you know, which kind of has pointers to the various buffers. Uh, these by default would get uh, allocated from the private space. So we made some changes um, to the Vertio front end stack to make sure that these ring buffers, uh, these ring uh, objects are allocated from the shared memory, right? So the, those, those, the, this kind of summarizes the changes we had to do in the Vertio front end stack to overcome the memory access limitation problem. Um, there are some alternate solutions that we want to explore in future um, to, especially from a performance perspective, uh, you know, so we want to explore whether we can achieve zero copy by, you know, something like a page flick, for example, right? Where, uh, you know, so dynamically, you know, we could open up access for the backend to the buffers uh, the, the, the to the buffers uh, which are page sized, right? Uh, so if there's if there's a buffer which is at least a page size, uh, in or multiples of page size, uh, at runtime with some support from the hypervisor, uh, if we can open up access to the backend so that it can access B1, then perhaps that avoids the bounce uh, operation, right? So. Uh, but there are some concerns we have, you know, the, and, and this means, you know, at runtime, we are making page table changes. So what would be the cost of those changes, whether it would, um, you know, um, dwarf uh, the benefits of zero copy, right? So, so those are some questions we have. So we, we need to do some prototype and see uh, whether it will actually, you know, be a win um, that we could go with, right? Um, and the second, uh, you know, the, the the second solution we have in mind is again, you know, uh, uh, if we want to avoid the shared memory region totally, maybe we are considering whether we can use some hypervisor interface uh, to copy data. So, for example, instead of uh, copying B1 to this region, uh, can hypervisor copy this to a region that primary VM will decide, right? So, so using some hypervisor support to uh, copy move data between VMs. So that's one option that we want to explore. Uh, and uh, the third option that I think you know we um, uh, someone from Linaro pointed out to us was using a modified I/O stack. You know something like SPDK, where we could control um, you know where I/O buffers are allocated in the first place. Right. So the problem with uh, using a you know the generic uh, I/O stack like you know like a file system uh, is so these I/O buffers are allocated way above the word I/O front end driver. So it could come anywhere from the guest address space. Uh, the, the other option that uh, you know we might consider is 
uh, a specialized IO stack, which moves a lot of the IO drivers um, into user space, you know, something like SPDK, where we might have better control so that these IO buffers, they are allocated from specific uh, region, right? So, and that might help us achieve zero copy. Um, so that we, are, we have to explore. Okay, we have some concerns, however, but we'll I'll probably skip those. So this um, is a you know uh, this is one part of the problem. How we overcome overcome the um, the memory access limitation problem. The second of the problem that we had to deal with was uh, lack of uh, support for MMIO. Uh, so the hypervisor that we are considering does not support uh, trapping uh, uh, config space uh, access and uh, delegating the handling of the of that to the backend. So in the absence of that, uh, right now uh, we we you know wherever there was a uh, 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 right now we have hacked up MMIO itself. Uh, so that instead of reading and writing, uh, instead of using readl and writel directly, uh, we are using the message queue API that the hypervisor supports to uh, send a message to the backend saying that I want to read, I want to read, you know, the front end wants to read or write this particular register. Uh, uh, you know, can you respond? Is that okay or not? Right. So, so right now we have gone ahead and reused what I mmio.c itself. Uh, converting readl and writel to be a message queue and uh, message queue send and receive. Um, uh, but the other option that we are also considering is uh, using a totally new different transport. I believe there is some work done in this regard by the IVSH mem uh, project uh, that we will also consider. So finally, the third uh, uh, problem that we had to deal with was there was uh, no ready to use backends that uh, would work uh, in our uh, 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 in our case uh, so we had to uh, we started with something like lkvm uh, uh, which is uh, you know a very simple uh, virtual machine monitor in um, uh, that works for arm uh, so we uh, heavily modified it to serve the function of just the backend uh, but you know, long long term, we think that it might uh, help to come up uh, uh, with some uh, you know from scratch new project for all the backend drivers that can potentially work across different hypervisors, right? You know, KVM, um, uh, Xen, uh, uh, multiple hypervisors. Uh, uh, you know, so if if we can do that consolidation, it'll be a good thing, I think. So we have had some discussion on the what are your dev mailing list. Uh, there were some concerns expressed uh, where that consolidation may not be straightforward, uh, but nevertheless, we want to uh, give it some thought uh, going forward. So the future work is, you know, we'll shortly be publishing the code, the, the changes we have done to the Vertio front end uh, to deal with the uh, memory access limitation on type one hypervisors. Uh, we'll, we want to get some feedback. And we are also seeing some uh, um, uh, performance issues. Part of it is because of uh, bounds. Uh, we want to see if we can, you know, improve that uh, performance um, degradation in any way. Uh, right, so that's uh, the summary of my work. Um, uh, I believe um, two minutes early, uh, but if you have any queries, my email ID is listed. So I would be interested to collaborate with few of you who are trying to solve uh, uh, similar problems and and uh, you know collaborate on uh, building a good solution for it uh, that can be upstreamed. Thank you for that. Um, there are some questions in chat, if you can answer them. Um, MMIO is not uh, same as IO MMU. Um, uh, so this MMIO is memory mapped uh, IO. So basically, typically, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 this is one of the transports that uh, Vertio offers. So uh, essentially, I probably don't have diagrams to illustrate MMIO, but 
so uh, this transport, we have multiple uh, options um, uh, uh, in Vortio. So, and what is used in ARM, in KVM on ARM, for example, is the MMIO transport. So if the front end wants to uh, read and write a particular register of the device, uh, it's like uh, uh, how you would uh, memory map the I, uh, register space of a real device and read and write to it using readl and writel. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, structured the same way, except those readl and writels uh, are actually trapped by the hypervisor, and um, and uh, they are emulated by the backend driver. So so that's uh, the mm io that I'm referring to. Uh, the bounce buffer, the performance good. Uh, we are seeing a lot of performance um, um, drop. Uh, so, and and we don't know whether all of that is completely due to the bounce buffer or uh, some, some 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 other factors are in play. We are doing more analysis, so we'll you know when we send some patches, we'll probably share the performance results. Um, Oh, the type one hypervisor we are uh, playing with right now is an in-house uh, hypervisor. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's it's being developed, so I will probably avoid talking too much about the hypervisor uh, that we are uh, playing with. Um, you know, going forward, uh, and I'm I'm expecting Qualcomm will make more. Uh, details available on the hypervisor that uh, we are working on. Um, the sound card, uh, yeah, so the, the although I talked about the sound card switch, uh, uh, it, it just illustrates the breadth of the problem, uh, the breadth of the devices that we are dealing with. We have not yet uh, you know, played with the uh, sound card uh, switch. Uh, I believe there are other folks uh, within Qualcomm who have uh, played with the uh, sound card uh, using the Vertio stack, some of them are probably, you know, being discussed uh, in the um, uh, uh, in the Vertio dev mailing list. Uh, so we are working with partners like Open Synergy uh, to achieve some sound card virtualization. So I don't have too many details on that. Uh, for GPU, again, I'm probably not the best guy. So there are uh, some some other groups within Qualcomm are working on uh, GPU virtualization. I don't have too many details on that. Android in uh, um, so uh, the Android uh, we are considering um, in this environment uh, if for to the most part it's like uh, running on bare metal. There's no difference. So it'll have fast board. It'll have USB. Uh, you know connections. Everything is available. So to a large extent, uh, the Android here is running on bare metal, and it should get near bare metal speeds. Uh, right, so the, the performance of Android is not uh, in influenced or it's not in impacted because of having a hypervisor. Uh, it's only the secondary VM whose uh, I/O virtualization is uh, a, which which does not have access to those I/O devices will have some performance impact uh, that it needs to consider when accessing I/O devices, uh, virtualized I/O devices. Uh, 